My name is Susie Allen. I'm the founding director of Artwise Curators. We've, we have curated the um, Vita Vitali show for Azerbaijan and we are very excited. I'm standing at the moment in front of this amazing tree by Ugo Rondononi. This is a tree that was actually made in Italy in Naples and it's all been hand finished. It's absolutely amazing. But what's so exciting for us is that we have a lot of trees uh, in our exhibition, a lot of olive trees. And this particular tree is based on the Grand Canal, so everybody can see it. And already it's attracting a huge amount of attention. This is Leila Aliyev, and this is an amazing room. It's called Life, and you can hear the beating heart in this room. This is Leila's own heart, and you can hear it really in here. It's amazing. And this is, this is her heart. Um, what you can see on the walls are, it's almost like a tree of life. So you see the trees that she's drawn, and they're all the roots coming up to the heart. So in a sense, it's the heart of our exhibition and it's incredibly beautiful. You feel both uh, something that's very daunting in here, but at the same time, you're feeling that there should be life, and it's very energetic, and, and it creates an enormous impression on everybody who comes in. It's an incredibly powerful and beautiful work. And as you, as you know, we've just come in from the Rondononi tree, so this is our next tree. It's also, in a sense, the entrance to our, our, our idea laboratory, which is all about a uh, positive thing, about trying to create a life that out of quite a daunting world that we're living in at the moment. So this is also a sign of a positive life, but it's a wake-up call. So, uh, hello, I'm, I'm Rachel Armstrong. I am the curator, the scientific curator of this space. Um, this is the Idea Laboratory. Um, and um, the Idea Laboratory really uh, gives us a sense of ongoingness. We've seen the exhibition and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know about uh, anyone else, but, you know, my heart sinks when I think about our relationship with nature and how we need a much better relationship um, for the future. So this space asks different kinds of questions that we hope might give us um, a sense of what that relationship might be. So rather than bite off some of these really, really big questions and, and answer, try to answer them all at once, we decided to make a question that was very specific to Venice. And Venice has two big problems out of many. And one of those is that it is polluted with plastics. Over 20,000 tonnes of plastics is uh, thrown into the lagoon every year. Um, the other problem that we have is that because of the runoff from agricultural feed, that we find lots of algae. So what we're trying to do is to ask a question whether the algae can be um, like a natural net to mop up the environmental plastics. And so all of the design work in this space speaks to that theme. It speaks to the idea of the artificial and the natural and you know, how we might create a different kind of relationship for a nature of the future. And so this, this work really is um, the experiment. It's um, a beach comb. And so we've started off with these plastics and we're going to be growing algae that we've harvested from Venice here. And what you can see is we're working towards this image of Venice here where um, we've got uh, an artificial island that is built for the city out of the plastics and the organisms which have formed this net. It forms a floating island that keeps up with sea level change and gradually it matures and transforms the new materials into a, a solid structure. And over here, Mike Perry, uh, in his photographic work, came across lots of different kinds of plastics that nature has already been cooking. It's already been transforming these materials into a much more solid form. So although we might initially 
think that building a plastic island out of algae and, and um, debris might take a very long time, the evidence from nature is that it works quite quickly. But we're also looking at new ways of working with the materials that we find. This is Studio Swine's um, sea chair, and they are designers who went out on a fishing trip. Um, whilst the fishermen trawled for fish, they trawled for plastics, they took the plastics out of the net, and whilst they were on the sea um, trip, they actually melted them down, sorted them into different colours, and made a stool. So they came back with two catches, one was fish, and the other was a stool. But of course we can be very sophisticated about the kinds of technologies that we bring together. Here we've got um, Julia Melchiori working with an incredible um, natural plastic. Plastic just really means a long polymer which gives it a stretchy uh, uh, characteristic. But this is nature's uh, plastic, it's silk, and in it are some incredible microfluidics. You can see what different kinds of patterns the leaf makes. And over here he's got a, a vision of Venice where these leaves leaves create a canopy in the afternoon to shade us from the sun and at night they've got solar panels and they turn into um, lamps that light our way. So this is a, an idea of how we can take these ideas and maybe even take them as far as an urban environment where we can now see buildings that are really much more like nature than um, the, you know, our modern buildings which have big shiny facades. And over here we've got Ecologic, which is um, uh, a little more speculative. These are futuristic bricolet. So these are the posts in Venice that are signposting our way, say, from the airport to the mainland. And instead of just being posts with electricity, what they are are sensors. So we've got green brains inside them. See these uh, little pots here? They are um, uh, touching the water and they are sensing the changes in the lagoon, and then they're able to change their position to let us know whether the water is healthy or not. So altogether, the work really speaks about different kinds of practices, um, the role of the artist in thinking about a new relationship with nature, and really trying to open up a realm of possibility. And you know, we hope that people will be able to come here in the next five or six months, and maybe they'll be able to see the algae growing in the tanks, a nice thick uh, mat. And really, we'd like people to leave um, with a sense that we can do something about this and that we're leaving a legacy that's very positive uh, for our children and for the people that come after us. This is an extraordinary work by Julian Opie. As you can see in, our, in on it, it's, a, it's an animation, but you can see all the amazing little ants coming down here. You've got butterflies and birds, and of course bees. And bees is a big um, subject matter for this whole area here. But you can just see it moving slightly, and you even see a plane that's going across there, and the little butterflies. It's absolutely beautiful. And again, it's a very much a summing up piece for a lot of this exhibition. I'm going to move on now to this piece. Um, this piece is by Chris Jordan, and it's an extraordinary drawing of 183,000 birds. Now, these birds are all drawn on here. There are 183,000 of them all. Um, but this actually is about the number of birds that gets killed through insecticide in America every single day. It's terrifying. Beautifully drawn, but gives a very, very sober message. And now over here is another piece by Chris Jordan, which is all about bees, and uh, which is really exciting. It has another sort of message to it as well, which is the number of bees that sort of get killed every day, again through insecticide, but the weight of this. Bees are really, really important to our whole being. I mean, we can't live without bees. And here we've got another bee piece, which is very solid, it's two tons in weight, very heavy to install, and it's by Bill Woodrow. And as you can see, the bees are like gold here. 
and they've been sort of polished like those to show how precious they are. But they're on something that's very solid and very meaningful because this is the solidness of what bees actually are in, um, inherent to our whole culture. Um, at the end there, we've got an amazing piece by Tony Cragg. And as people know Tony Cragg's work, you can see all sorts of figures and heads and shapes in them. And in a sense, this actually is another key piece to our exhibition in the sense that it's people who, uh, it's about coming together. It's about exploring that whole idea of well-being between the human race and how precious the human race is. But Tony gives a very, very slight warning here in the color. It's almost a blood color. So again, this is up for discussion and a trigger point of what our exhibition is about. Have a look closely and you can see all the figures and the heads. It's wonderful. Hi, my name is Dea Vanagan. I'm one of the curators of Vita Vitale, of Artwise Curators. Um, this piece that we're standing in front of here is by Siobhan Hapaska and is called A Great Miracle Needs to Happen There. It consists of nine olive trees that are jacked up on car jacks that have been inlaid with brass and steel. Eight out of the nine trees are burnt, representing loss and, uh, and, and sort of, you know, very much a foreboding feeling. The central tree, which we'll come to in a moment, represents endurance and livelihood. Again, coming back to the themes of the exhibition of Vita Vitale, it's very much about that delicate balance between man and nature. And for us, the title of the, of the work was very important. A great miracle needs to happen there. And very much within our own world, a great miracle needs to happen. In this next room, there's three installations, three artworks by Jaco Olivier who's uh, an artist from the Netherlands. And what you see, the large piece here is called Turning Point. Um, he uses a technique, he's a painter, but he uses a technique which uh, involves stop motion animation in where he paints a picture, takes a capture, captures the image, paints another picture, captures the image, and together creates a film. Um, the, the largest piece that we have, Turning Point in the show, features a polar bear. As you watch the film, you realize he's uh, searching for food, swims down and finds a fish. And as he's trying to come up on land to eat water, uh, to eat the food on ice, um, he realizes he can't find any of the ice. So it's sort of really uh, harnessing back to the fact that our ice caps are melting and it's, it's really disrupting the livelihood of, of the natural animals. The smaller piece up there that we have is bird, um, as you can see done in the same stop motion painted technique. And the third piece, Bayako, that we have here is wood, which um, as you watch the film, you sort of, you see these beautiful images of, of a parkland and woodland that, that sort of get disrupted throughout with everything from images of oil rigs and people walking throughout. So <clears throat> in this room, we have the paintings by Julian Perry, British artist. And Julian Perry is uh, essentially paints landscapes, traditional landscapes in the south coast of England. And in doing his paintings, he noticed that from one day to the next, the, the whole coastline was being eroded. The, it was changing before his eyes and these birch trees were falling off the cliffs. So in this series of works that's been commissioned for the exhibition, the landscape is now no longer and the falling trees with no soil becomes a subject of, the, of his paintings in a monumental scale. Um, into this room we have our youngest artist in the exhibition, Stephanie Quayle, also a British artist. And here we're seeing uh, another commission that we did for Vita Vitale. It is called Jenga. Jenga is a, a game that you play by putting sticks in a pile and you try to withdraw a stick without the pile falling over. So this is indicating the precarious balance of nature. And on the planks of wood that are piled up here, we can see terracotta monkeys. There are five different species, all of whom are in endangered. So from 
the youngest commissioned artist to Rose Wiley, who is a 81-year-old British painter. I think you'll agree that this is the most vibrant and beautiful paintings that she's done again as a special commission, looking into the, the theme of endangered and species that need to be protected. And along with Rose Wiley's works, we have Laura Ford, a Welsh sculptor, whose works you can see are a dimension that's childlike. It's almost like you have uh, children dressed up as animals, but the animals are unable to move. They can't, they can't move, but they look around and protect one another, and also looking at the painting. In this room we see a work by Ida Mamadova, and, and this is her piece that she has um, contributed to the exhibition that is sharing her thoughts and memories of the Caspian Sea. Along with Naomi Goodall, who is a French artist. Um, she's a photographer, but she intervenes into the landscape. So here you'll see what looks like a beautiful waterfall in the wood, but when you look carefully, it's plastic. A mountain of plastic, so she intervenes into the landscape and then photographs it. Likewise, with her iceberg, the image that you're seeing if you look closely is polystyrene, which of course is a, a, a great problem, a great issue, and one of the issues that we're um, contemplating in the exhibition about the plastic pollutions and non biodegradable works. Um, here, Naomi's not used any Photoshop at all. This is, a, this is a, again, an intervention into the landscape that, um, that delivers a beautiful, large-scale, monumental photograph. Uh, so this piece we have hanging here is by Mircea Cantor, Romanian artist. Um, this piece is four meters in diameter and consists of uh, four perspex plates and what you see here are um, recycled pop cans that have been made into ashtrays. Um, a lot of Mercia's, Mercia's work um, involves uh, reappropriation of materials and here he's, um, he's sourced these uh, pop cans uh, that have been turned into uh, cigarette ashtrays and basically recycled the recycled material to create this work. Very evocative of uh, stained glass windows um, in churches, Notre Dame, you know, very, very much sort of the, the kind of the religious, um, religious sort of uh, geometric kind of shapes that you find. Um, here you see a light box of his piece um, called No Title, but the piece here reads Unpredictable Future. And that to us was such a poignant point that really just brings home the, the core context of the exhibition. In here we're showing a film by Chris Jordan. It's actually um, a, a preview of a longer, uh, a trailer for a longer feature film he's working on called Medway, Message from the Gyre. Um, the piece is, um, this piece is showing basically a documentary of an island that's 2,000 miles away from any human existence, um, which is where all the albatrosses collect and live. And what's happening is that um, plastics are floating from the sea and arriving at this island, and the mother albatrosses are feeding the baby albatrosses, and essentially it's, it's killing them. So it's, it, it, it's really sort of bringing home the, the horrific message of all the rubbish and, and garbage that just sort of gets uh, left and floating in, in, in the seas ends up um, to areas where humans don't, uh, where humans don't even inhabit, and it's harming, it's harming the, the livelihood of, of, of animals. Um, going into this room, this piece is by American artist Diana Thater. Um, she is a, a really seminal artist when it comes to um, ecologically minded uh, artworks. She, she works in time-based media, and this specific piece is called Untitled, uh, Butterfly Video Wall Number 2, and it's all about the uh, monarch butterfly, which is, as you may know, is, is, is heavily endangered. And this whole installation and how you experience it and walk around, um, very much sort of uh, evocative of, of the butterfly wings, and just, um, it, it's, it's really meant to kind of bring you that step closer to um, 
to, to the lives of, of, of the butterflies and realizing how, how delicate and precious and, and really important they are within our ecosystem. These two pieces here um, are by an artist from the Netherlands called Bas Prinsen. The, they are photographs of, um, of basically garbage cities that are based in Cairo. Um, upon first glance, you, you sort of see this, um, just this, this mountain of rubbish and, and garbage bags, and, and, and you think, you feel very sort of, um, you feel very sympathetic towards the people living there. But actually, um, with speaking to the artists, it's, it's a very vibrant community that's very supportive of one another. Um, you see sort of satellite dishes um, denoting that people are living there very actively, and what they, what they do is they collect and sort garbage and, and live off of other people's garbage, so it's really, it's really sort of a, a celebration of, of being, um, you know, resourceful and, you know, one, one man's trash is another man's treasure. His um, latest feature film, Watermark in the Next Room, um, and uh, which is on a continuous loop, very, very specially for us for the exhibition. and. Um, it's, it's a 90-minute film and, and really talks about globally how man has harnessed, um, harnessed water for, for their own benefit, but also the, the, the pressure that it's putting with, on, on the environment and on the world. So in the same room as Bertinsky's photographs, aerial photographs, we have Loris Cecchini. Um, he is Italian. Uh, lives and works in Berlin, and this is his installation called Water Bones. The installation takes a different form every time the artist will show it. He very much responds to the space and responds to the architecture. Um, the work is, uh, is almost molecular in structure. He creates it module by module and draws in the space. Here we have a site-specific installation that was commissioned for Vita Vitale by Paul Huxley. Paul Huxley is an abstract painter, as you can see, and this special wall drawing is much more than the abstract forms and colours that we see. In fact, every wall responds to a statistical equivalent um, relating to melting ice caps, relating to the CO2 emissions or the sustainability of the planet. And in the same room, we have a connection with worldometers that specially streams live statistics. It's a very special room in the Palazzo as well. This is a room that Canaletto painted a very famous view of the Grand Canal and the Rialto Bridge that we see outside. So in this room we can start with the sculptures of Tanya Kovats, British sculptor. Um, this work, Reefs, uh, Reef 1 and Reef 2, were the result of a, a residency that the artist did in the Galapagos Islands. Um, she, was very, uh, she was very taken with the colonies of barnacles that formed and were self-sustaining. They're also very reminiscent of coral, which we know is, a, is um, in great danger of, uh, of, of um, sorry, the corals in great danger due to the acidity of the seas. Um, in the same room, we see the photographs by Mike Perry. Mike Perry is originally from Wales, and um, he, he goes along to the beaches and picks up, all over the world, picks up plastics that have been washed up, washed up in the, on the shores. And you can see in very sort of forensic detail how the plastic has been um, deformed and shaped from the sea. And in this series of uh, soles, shoe soles, washed up from anywhere from Wales to Tanzania, this for us is really indicative of the overarching theme of the human footprint. Here we see the installation by Uzbekistan artist Sayora Nguyen. This work is um, an homage to 
uh, displaced population from the, the man-made intervention to the Aral Sea. So the draining of the sea caused a whole population to lose work, lose home and having to find a new place to, to dwell. So in this film that we see in the same room as Sayora, it's a work by Graham Stevens from 1974. This is a documentary film that we've borrowed from the archive of the Pompidou Center. Graham Stevens invented the inflatable structure and in this film we see uh, a work called um, Desert Cloud. It's a self-inflating membrane. This is quite a good shot to get when you can see it. It's a self-inflating membrane that uh, reacts to the sun, inflates, and becomes a sort of cloud that can actually have the, the potential and the possibility to bring water to the desert. And finally, we have the work of Khalil Chishti. <clears throat> Khalil's from Pakistan, lives in New York, and this installation called One After the Other is entirely made by him, sculpted by hand, but using plastic bags, rubbish bags as you can see.